Hey there again, it's Dr. Peebler coming back for another episode of Cancer is a Mitochondrial Metabolic Disease. To my American countrymen, I hope that everyone had a safe and wonderful 4th of July weekend. We left off on this slide here talking about the electron transport chain that happens along the inner mitochondrial membrane. But as you know, we talked about several things that mitochondria do from a very high level. And I want to continue this conversation because the mitochondria are much more than just energy factories, as we've alluded to. So this is a really neat picture of all the different, not only functions, but a lot of different parameters relating to mitochondria. So if we look at the first portion here, we see that there are a lot of different characteristics of how mitochondria are arranged and how abundant they are in various cell types within our body. So for example, we have the highest density of mitochondria in our hearts and in our brains. So in those cells, you're going to have a high volume of mitochondria. It also varies on how many copies of mitochondrial DNA. Yes, mitochondria have their own DNA, which we'll talk about at length in the mitochondrial heteroplasmy portion of this. But yes, the copy numbers vary. How much oxygen they consume depends on the metabolic requirements of that cell. And then where they actually are located relative to the nucleus. It could, they could be around the nucleus or they could be further in the periphery. Maybe in a cell where there is a lot of gene expression and there needs to be a lot of energy for the nucleus to do its job, then perhaps the mitochondria will be highly dense in that area. Whereas in, let's say this looks like a neuron. So in this particular cell, maybe there's a lot of neurotransmitters that are being made and that requires a lot of energy and, there, and therefore the mitochondria can be located there. Then it talks about features of the mitochondria and that could be whether the mitochondria has DNA damage and mutation such as mitochondrial heteroplasmy, and we'll talk about that at length, whether or not the membranes have abundant and healthy fats like cardiolipin and various metabolites and chemical precursors like NAD, whether or not the proteins that are being expressed either by the mitochondrial DNA or the nuclear DNA are being assembled properly. Whether or not the crista, which we'll talk about, but these outpouchings that help increase mitochondrial surface area for the energy production portion of mitochondria, whether or not the crista are disordered or whether or not they're highly organized. And then the morphology, whether or not they are very small, whether or not they're more elongated and complex. Then their actual activities, whether or not the electron transport chain complexes are actually functioning, how good or how strong is the membrane potential or the mitochondrial membrane potential? Basically, how effective is the mitochondrial capacity to separate protons into the inner mitochondrial membrane space, which then creates a more potential energy for ATP production? Whether or not proteins that are made outside the mitochondria are being able to be imported appropriately, whether or not proteins from DNA inside the mitochondria are being able to be translated and used effectively? And then is the mitochondria able to actually uptake metabolites like it's supposed to so that it can use those things for various functions? And then the actual mitochondrial function itself, is the oxidative phosphorylation system functioning correctly? Is ATP being made effectively and to the degree that the cell needs? Is calcium being regulated? Calcium is an important intracellular and extracellular messenger. And when you have defective calcium storage, that can cause major damage within in mitochondria and even cell death. Is the reactive oxygen species that are made by mitochondrial electron transport being created in the amounts that is necessary for proper signaling or an excess that's causing damage and inflammation? Are certain hormones like cortisol and other steroid hormones being created? And then lastly, how are the mitochondria actually behaving? We're going to talk about a whole section of something called mitochondrial dynamics, which is basically how mitochondria act within a cell, depending on the nutrient need, depending on mitochondrial heteroplasmy, depending depending on many factors. Are they mobile? Are they signaling to the nucleus the important things that are happening in the environment? Are they releasing mitochondrial DNA or cytochrome C oxidase or the mitochondrial transition pore that can signal to the cell that there's danger and that potentially there needs to be programmed cell death? Or are the mitochondria communicating within the cell and outside the cell appropriately? A lot of important jobs. So I just wanted to pull this up again because this is a really beautiful representation of how the TCA cycle in the mitochondrial matrix is located right alongside the electron transport chain here. And a couple of things I wanted to point out in particular in this picture. So right here in this step at cytochrome C oxidase or complex four, this is where we take oxygen that we breathe in. This is the main reason why we breathe and have lungs and have red blood cells that carry oxygen throughout the body is so that this step right 
right here, oxygen can be converted to water. And if anybody is a follower of Dr. Jack Cruz, he talks about how the matrix water is different than water in other parts of the body. Basically in the inner mitochondrial matrix, we are making deuterium depleted water at this step right here. And if your mitochondria are healthy and they're making a lot of deuterium depleted water, you're going to be in a state of health. If for example, you see these, all these H pluses here, this is hydrogen that are being pumped into the inner membrane space. And that's creating this Delta P or this Delta Psi, which is the mitochondrial membrane potential, which then when the protons or the hydrogen ions get funneled down through complex five or the ATP synthase to use its electrochemical potential energy to make ATP, you can see that hydrogen is in these areas and is being used actively, not only to make water, but to form this gradient. And we'll talk about this later, but this is where deuterium does its horrible things because deuterium, if it gets into this space here, will damage the complex five or the ATP synthase. It will stop it from spinning and rotating effectively, which will lead to electrons that should be being transferred to create excess reactive oxygen species. But also we will lose the membrane potential and we will have a lack or a deficiency of ATP. And again, as we'll talk about later, one of the reasons why certain scientists, biochemists hypothesize that the TCA cycle or the Krebs cycle has so many steps is because it is actually arranging the carbon molecules so that we're getting rid of deuterium to the greatest extent possible so that when NADH and FADH2 transfer electrons at this step and at this step, we're minimizing the amount of deuterium that end up here so we don't break this so we have plenty of ATP. This is a really cool slide also, because what this is showing is not just a mitochondria. It's showing where, for the most part, where everything is at. So as we've talked about in the past, this is the, this is the matrix. This is where the TCA cycle intermediates are happening. And it is interacting directly with the ETC, the electron transport chain. And this is where the proteins are lined up on the inner mitochondrial membrane. And this area here, the inner membrane space, for example, would be where all the excess hydrogen protons are being pumped into. And then we have other things like the calcium channels. We have metafusin protein. We have other channels for ATP and potassium. We have stands for mitochondrial reactive oxygen species. And then we have mitochondrial DNA. Mitochondrial DNA is also inside the mitochondrial matrix. So if we have excess ROS reactive oxygen species, we can see how that can directly damage mitochondrial DNA, which can lead to excess mitochondrial heteroplasmy, which we'll talk about again at length in the near future. So one of the other things that mitochondria do is that they are, they act as environmental sensors for the rest of the body. It's kind of like Dr. Cruz talks about mitochondria are our sixth sense. So I'm going to read this here. Mitochondria are undergoing a renaissance. The cellular power plant is now recognized as a key cellular signaling platform. The signals released by mitochondria are currently in an area of intense research. A complex network is emerging involving metabolic intermediates, the roles of mitochondrial unfolded protein response, and the interaction of mitochondria with other organelles and with the cellular autophagic system. Despite the diversity of perturbations leading to mitochondrial diseases, some emerging trends are apparent. The long-held notion that mitochondria mitochondrial diseases resulted from a mitochondrial energy output has been challenged by new data showing that mitochondrial pathological signaling can cause disease irrespective of energy output. This review proposes a novel integrative view of mitochondrial signaling in physiology and disease. So what we have here is we have our colony of mitochondria, aka our environmental sensors. And when there are mitochondrial genetic defects, aka mitochondrial heteroplasmy or cellular stresses of any type, generally cellular stresses are transferred via chemical intermediates or reactive oxygen species or inflammation. These are cellular stressors that act as signaling to the mitochondria. And these mitochondria can sense these things and then they can give signals out to the rest of the cell. And then that can cause adaptation, not only within the mitochondria, but have other signals, as we'll see shortly, that will change genetic expression in the nucleus and in the mitochondrial DNA. And these things feed back on itself. And so what is becoming more clear is that mitochondria as environmental sensors are basically controlling nuclear DNA or the main DNA that most of us think of as controlling and being the brain of the cell, the nucleus. The nucleus is receiving information from the environment to then adapt and express certain proteins to handle those stresses or adapt to those stresses. So what we're seeing here is there are nutrients that come in, they get metabolized, and then depending on how much ATP is actually produced, that can then signal downstream effects like AMP kinase, which we've talked about during the cancer series, and that can control gene expression within the nucleus. And then certain metabolites 
other metabolites, like we've talked about several times in the past, pyruvate, succinate, lactate, all these metabolites can then also change DNA and gene expression and control the way the cell is adapting to stressors in the micro environment. Exceedingly fascinating. And as I've kind of alluded to, there are actually direct communications between the nucleus of the cell where the majority of the DNA is located at and the mitochondria. And as it says here, mitochondria, the cell's major energy producers, also act as signaling hubs, interacting with other organelles, both directly and indirectly. Despite having its own circular genome, the majority of mitochondrial proteins are encoded by the nuclear DNA. To respond to changes in cell physiology, the mitochondria must send signals to the nucleus, which can, in turn, upregulate gene expression to alter metabolism or initiate a stress response. This is known as retrograde signaling. A variety of stimuli and pathways fall under the retrograde signaling umbrella. Mitochondrial dysfunction has already been shown to have severe implications for human health. Disruption of retrograde signaling, whether directly associated with mitochondrial dysfunction or cellular environmental changes, may also contribute to pathological deficits. So I'm going to try to deconstruct this diagram here. So essentially, the mitochondria, through either intermediates and retrograde signals, can directly change gene expression within the nucleus, which then can, for example, have a cellular growth and proliferation response, can quelch inflammatory pathways, can modulate the immune system, can modulate metabolism and how we burn carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, and make energy. It can send signals out back to the mitochondria. For example, PGC1-alpha is going to be a chemical that we talk about at length when we're talking about mitochondrial biogenesis. It can increase inflammatory markers. It can have signals that limit program cell death. It can send proteins to the mitochondria for assistance, and it can help help in controlling mitogenesis, which is another name for mitochondrial biogenesis, or the increasing the amount of mitochondria available. It can help control mitophagy, which is the mitochondria-specific autophagy, which stands for cellular recycling, and it can directly influence oxidative phosphorylation or energy production. So I have touched on this in the past, but I want to reiterate that these chemical substrates that are made both in glycolysis, outside the mitochondria, and all the the chemical intermediates within the mitochondria can be clinically used by certain types of practitioners. The test that we're looking at here is called an organic acid test or OAT testing. And this has been used within the integrative and functional space for quite some time. And what we can do is we can see functionally where, for example, there's an elevation of citrate, or there's an elevation of malate or succinate or lactate or beta hydroxybutyrate. And we can see indirectly where these enzymes that are converting these particular intermediates are not being effectively converted to the next step. And we can then diagnose potentially why that could be. As we talked about in the past, these enzymatic steps to go from citric acid to cis aconitinic acid require enzymes. And those enzymes require cofactors. And those cofactors in this case may be iron and glutathione, whereas fluoride, mercury, arsenic, and lead may be blocking those. So if we don't find the deficiency, the nutrient deficiency that's blocking that enzyme, we may go looking now for heavy metal toxicities and help us understand how we remove that blockade. So now citric acid can be converted to the next intermediate step, the next intermediate step, and then you can actually make energy like you're supposed to through the electron transport chain. There's several ways that we can look at reactive oxygen species and oxidative stress markers to know whether or not you have an excess amount of these, I'll call them chemical messengers because they, under normal physiologic conditions, they are chemical messengers, but when they're in excess, they can cause damage to the mitochondria and the mitochondrial DNA mitochondrial proteins, they can subsequently cascade into uncontrolled chronic inflammation. So it would be wise if you don't already have someone in your local area. I don't know where you're even watching this video from. You could be in Australia. You could be in New Zealand. You could be in England. You could be in Kansas. You could be in Texas. You could be in California. You could be in Florida like me. But the bottom line is there are functional medicine, integrative medicine doctors who can at minimum order these tests. Now, whether or not they can interpret them well, I can't. I can't speak for that, but they can at minimum order these tests and they can give us a better understanding about how your mitochondria are functioning, which is a very important thing to know, not only for cancer, but for pretty much any pathology or disease process has mitochondrial function, or should I say dysfunction at its root cause. So it's important information to know. Now, I personally, as a clinician, as a doctor, 
have changed my tune where I'm not doing exactly what the other integrative and functional medicine doctors are doing. I have turned more towards the quantum mechanics and quantum biology where I want to give as little to the body as possible, except for what it really needs, what it actually cannot make. Things that it can make, I don't necessarily want to make a dose because there can be harm in that. There are negative feedback loops. There could be down regulation of endogenous systems where you're not making it anymore. But that is a nuanced stance in a clinical stance that is above and beyond the scope of this video. But that being said, my point is as a patient, as a consumer of healthcare, as a mitochondriac, as someone who wants to know whether they're healthy or not, there are a plethora of tests that a integrative or functional medicine doctor can order to help you understand what situation that you're in. And if anything that I'm going to try to hammer home during this entire series is that mitochondrial dysfunction is not only the basis of cancer, but it's also the basis of all disease. And so therefore, this is where you need to be looking to maintain your health. If you like these videos, if you want me to keep making them, I'm probably going to make them regardless if you like them or not, because I have to get this information out so that I can, at minimum, have one person be touched by this and fix their mitochondria and prevent cancer or reverse cancer or whatever it is. But if you like these videos, I would like you to please like it, comment, ask questions, interact with others, and subscribe. And if you can share it to someone who needs to hear this, who has disease, who wants to be more preventive-minded, please share it with them. And I'd be happy to teach them alongside you. Until next time.